we made this. Hi everyone, Carl here. Bit of a different episode of the podcast today, because there's no guest with me for this one. You're stuck with me, I'm afraid. So, later this week I'm going to release an episode about Francois Truffaut's film The 400 Blows. Of course, this is a bit of a departure from the movie Palace, because we usually focus on English language cinema, so I just thought I'd take this opportunity to speak briefly about the cinematic phenomenon that Truffaut's film is a part of, namely the French New Wave. The aim is just to give you a bit of a basic overview today, as a bit of a primer for our upcoming episode on The 400 Blows. So when did the French New Wave happen, and why is it worthy of attention? Well, although some commentators disagree on how to define the time frame precisely, generally speaking, the late 1950s and early 1960s are particularly important to this movement. In terms of its significance, the New Wave, or La Nouvelle Vague, is commonly regarded as a vibrant period in the history of French cinema, which produced widely acknowledged classics including The 400 Blows and Breathless. Such films, which were highly personal to the directors and made on low budgets, were not only noteworthy for their quality, they had a broader cultural significance. They changed perceptions about French cinema, and they had an impact on filmmakers from all around the world. Perhaps the key reason that many of these films appealed, and continue to appeal, to subsequent filmmakers, is that the directors associated with the movement, including Truffaut and Jean-Luc Godard, embody a romantic approach to directorial freedom, because the films of the new wave were made via approaches that contrasted with traditional norms. For example, where mainstream French films generally were shot in studios and had big budgets, new wave films privileged spontaneity and the individual artistry of auteur directors. They can therefore be said to represent an approach to film which challenged the dominant model of commercial cinema. Before I talk about this further, I think it's useful to assess the broader cultural context in France at the time. The new wave emerged during a period when hopes of post-war social change were diminishing, although economic change was occurring. The 1950s and early 1960s saw the midpoint of a prolonged post-war economic boom, which saw 30 years of growing prosperity. So on the one hand, you had an increased emphasis on consumerism and affluence, whilst at the same time, France also saw traditional social structures weaken. For example, during this period, big housing projects outside cities replaced familiar neighbourhoods. Also, this was a time frame when television became firmly established in France as aspects of mass culture, often emanating from America, acquired a new allure. And concurrently, a new generation was rising to prominence. Indeed, the term new wave was first applied not to filmmakers like Godard or Truffaut, but instead to a generation of young people. The term came from a growing fascination with the nation's youth that was seen in media outlets such as magazines. This fascination related to factors including the cultural tastes, sexual attitudes, religious beliefs, and social behaviour of the new generation. Specifically, an investigation published in the news magazine L'Express applied the term Nouvelle Vague to the nation's youth in 1957. By the following year, the term had gained wider currency, and soon it was applied to film. At first, the term was employed in relation to films that reflected new social attitudes. Later, the term became more specifically associated with an emerging generation of young directors whose work captured the sense of alienation many young people felt as part of this generational shift. In particular, it was the 1959 Cannes Film Festival that helped solidify this idea, with the festival featuring Truffaut's The 400 Blows and Alan René's Hiroshima Mon Amour. After the 59 festival, when L'Express referred to the Nouvelle Vague, it was referring to new films by young directors. In addition, Cannes brought the Nouvelle Vague phenomenon to international attention. So which directors are especially uh, identified with the French New Wave? Now, some tend to associate the movement squarely with those directors seen as being at the heart of the phenomenon, namely Godard, Truffaut, Eric Romer, Jacques Rivette, and Claude Chabrol. These figures were known colloquially as the Young Turks and had all worked together at the film magazine Cahier du Cinema. Other significant directors include the Left Bank filmmakers, such as Agnes Varda, Alan René, and Chris Marker. They lived on the left bank of Paris, as well as being left-wing politically. In addition, there are directors such as Jack Demy and Louis Mal, who shared an affinity with the aspirations of the new wave, even if they are not commonly seen as being at the centre of the phenomenon. Now, it's worth noting that the Young Turks consistently took a sceptical view of attempts to categorise their movement. At a 1960 press conference, for example, Truffaut, Godard and Roma agreed that the new wave is merely diversity. This statement reflecting the belief that commonalities between the new wave filmmakers were externally imposed. Uh, e.g. by the press. In other words, there was no overarching plan or manifesto. 
Indeed, the range of enduring new wave films do attest to the fact that the output of this movement was very eclectic. Instead, the new wave filmmakers shared some personal friendships and some common affinities that were often situated in opposition to the mainstream filmmaking practices of the previous generation. So the new wave represented an unprecedented changing of the guard. To illustrate this, I can tell you that at least 160 new filmmakers in France made their first feature films between January 1959 and the end of 1962, and this figure was well above average. But it wasn't just the fact that films were being made by up-and-coming directors, it was how they were being made. What I mean is that the new generation challenged the established methods of getting things done. Post-war France had rigid structures in place for filmmaking. This was a controlled climate where anyone who wanted to make a film had to obtain an official document that functioned much like a union card. The most straightforward way to obtain this document was by doing a long apprenticeship with an established director. After the war, another possible trajectory emerged. Directors could learn their craft by making short films, usually documentaries, um, and this approach was mainly followed by the left bank figures. Now, neither of these options appealed to the young Turks. Since they generally disparaged the state of established French cinema, the idea of doing apprenticeships with directors they often did not appreciate was apparently not an enticing one. Instead, they felt that being a film critic prepared them to become directors in their own right. In essence, the Young Turks all had an abiding passion for film and were generally rebellious in nature, and in their writing they took polemical positions that made uh, Cahier du Cinema an exciting publication to read, and their viewpoints suggested some of the directions their own films would ultimately take. Their polemical spirit was epitomised by Truffaut's seminal essay, A Certain Tendency of the French Cinema, published in 1954, which attacked something called the tradition of quality, or le cinéma du papa. This was a dominant type of mainstream French filmmaking that was often dependent on literary source material, and was felt by its detractors to be artificial and divorced from reality. Truffaut's attacks on the tradition of quality were rather personal. Much of what he wrote was specifically aimed at leading directors and respected screenwriters. In his view, there could be no peaceful coexistence between those films that were dominated by scriptwriters and those that were created by true auteurs, such as Jean Renoir or Robert Bresson. Following Truffaut's intervention, the other Cahier critics were forthright about which directors they felt qualified as auteurs and those who didn't. His polemical stance became known as the politique des auteurs. In essence, the Young Turks divided film directors into two camps, those whose efforts were not worthy of further attention on one side, and auteurs on the other, these being people such as Roberto Rossellini, or Orson Welles, or Alfred Hitchcock. In fact, their defence of certain American, or American-based, auteurs was especially controversial. Because American cinema was highly commercial, this seemed antithetical to some, who felt that the Hollywood studio system was not conducive to individual expression. Furthermore, Truffaut and Co. were also fond of B-movies, which some critics of the auteur theory found difficult to reconcile. Nevertheless, the politique des auteurs undeniably had a profound impact on the way films and filmmakers were perceived. It helped elevate the reputation of someone like Hitchcock, who at that time was generally regarded as merely a great entertainer. Now, of course, Hitchcock is widely acclaimed as a great artist. Another byproduct of the politique des auteurs is that it encouraged people to see the potential for artistic expression in generic forms such as the musical or the western. In terms of the new wave, the polemical stance pioneered by Truffaut helped shape the way he and his peers would approach their own films. For instance, their admiration for someone like Rossellini is echoed in their refusal to make films that fall neatly into conventional categories, and their tendency to make films that are highly personal in nature. So what the Cahier du Cinema critics did was make their first films on shoestring budgets using personal funds, supporting each other morally and practically as they did so. Their films differed strikingly from those of the tradition of quality, which were usually associated with lavish sets and costumes, finely honed scripts, and glamorous stars giving theatrical performances. By contrast, films like Breathless were shot in the streets and featured appealingly raw acting. In addition, the new wave filmmakers strove to exploit the possibilities of cinematic technique in a manner intended to mark out their films as the product of an overriding individual artistry. So they experimented with sound and image in ways that meant the viewer became aware of the camera work, aware of the editing. Famously, for instance, Goddard frequently employs jump cuts in Breathless, which are an obvious example of a technique that differs from a more mainstream editing style due to its discontinuous nature. Meanwhile, the new wave directors used lightweight cameras, which had been developed for use in documentaries, as well as other equipment that was conducive with innovation. 
As a result, camera work in new wave films is often very mobile, being comprised of shots that are often achieved in inventive ways. Meanwhile, the language spoken in these films is generally more authentic than was commonly employed in other French films of this era. Now, some of these technical choices exemplified both the underpinning aspirations of these directors as well as the practical realities they faced. Put simply, the use of street locations, natural light and ambient sound made sense artistically and financially, because studio shooting was costly and therefore off-limits. And one of the reasons some of these filmmakers tended to use fewer takes is because of the expensiveness of film stock, but this served to give their films a productive, spontaneous quality. And this gave the new wave a prevailing sense of truthfulness, though what this meant in practical terms differed greatly uh, between individual directors. It's worth pointing out another way in which the likes of Godard and Truffaut differed from their forerunners. They belonged to a generation that positively adored cinema. Cinema going in France at this time was, in large part, a young person's pastime. 43% of spectators in Parisian cinemas were between 15 and 24 during the 1950s. Remember that, although this was a period of economic growth, this was a time not too far removed from the horrors of the Second World War, and in particular memories of the occupation of France. In this relatively bleak context, films represented on a basic level, escape. Fueling the growing sense that cinema was not just a popular form of entertainment, but arguably the principal art form of the 20th century, were institutions like the French Cinémathèque, or the Cinémathèque Francais, uh, and two extended networks of film clubs. These places screened a wide variety of films that could not be seen elsewhere, as well as offering forums where young enthusiasts could meet, exchange ideas, and form friendships. Perhaps it is unsurprising that for a generation familiar with the deprivations of occupied France, as well as the aftermath of the post-war period, American films held a particular appeal for French cinephiles of this time, uh, who found Hollywood's vivid colours and larger-than-life imagery intensely alluring. At the same time, the new wave filmmakers admired less respectable American films too. Uh, like I mentioned, they were really fond of B-movies. Uh, their passion for film is important because they populated their work with references to other films as part of an overall approach whereby audiences are continually reminded that they are watching a film. Therefore, the French New Wave embodies a sense of self-reflexivity that marks it out as a modern phenomenon. Jean-Luc Godard put it quite poetically when he said that he and his peers had given a new country to the world, a country whose name was cinema. If 1959 and 1960, which saw the successful release of The 400 Blows and Breathless, uh, represented the height of the new wave, then the euphoria soon died away. It wasn't long until parts of the press began to attack the movement, which can be attributed to various factors. For one thing, Truffaut sensed a desire for revenge on behalf of established figures, whilst another suggestion was that the new wave was being blamed for a general decline in ticket sales. Also, there was an increasingly polarised political climate, and many felt that new wave films were too amoral, or alternatively, that they lacked sufficient political commitment. Above all, I think it's significant that subsequent films by the Young Turks failed to live up to the likes of the 400 Blows uh, in commercial terms. Whilst there were certainly great new wave films that came after 1960, uh, Agnes Varda's Cleo from 5 to 7 being a case in point, the movement is generally felt to have receded after around 1962 or 1963, because the key directors involved started to mark out very different career paths. As I alluded to earlier though, the legacy of the French new wave was deeply felt around the world, with other new waves emerging in various countries, led by directors who found the French example inspiring. So I'll leave you with a couple of quotes that I've taken from Naomi Green's book, The French New Wave and New Look, uh, which is a great read if you're interested in these films, by the way. The first quote is from Martin Scorsese, who said that the most important contribution of the French New Wave was to give a visible image of liberty to every aspiring director. The first films of Godard, Truffaut, Chabrol, Rivette, Roma and others gave you the feeling that you yourself could make a film anywhere, with anyone, and using any story that you didn't need expensive material, styles, or powerful equipment. I also wanted to read you a quote from Abbas Kiarostami, one of Iran's greatest filmmakers. For him, the French New Wave changed his way of imagining or looking at cinema. Before that time, I believed that cinema belonged to superstars, to studios and elaborate sets. Afterwards, I could see myself and my neighbours in films. It revealed a different path. So I'll wrap up here, I think, since I just wanted to give you a bit of an overview of the French New Wave movement today. If I could boil it down to a single sentence, I'd say that the New Wave was a key period in the history of French cinema that involved cine-literate filmmakers who broke new ground by opposing the mainstream filmmaking practices employed by the previous generation. 
This has been quite a general podcast, but I hope uh, you can join me later this week for the next episode of The Movie Palace. As I said earlier, it's about Truffaut's The 400 Blows, and Raquel Stetcher joins me on that episode to discuss what is undoubtedly one of the most important films of the French New Wave. Uh, but that's all for today. Bye for now, listeners. Hello, everyone. This is Tony, Network Chief of We Made This. As you know, our podcast network brings together a brilliant assortment of talent who talk about all kinds of pop culture content, such as the episode you just listened to, or maybe you're just about to listen to. We're not going anywhere, but we'd love to keep the lights on for even longer if you're able to support our network on Patreon. For just £2 a month, you get your name in lights and the satisfaction of knowing you're helping us produce more great audio. And for £3 a month, you'll get your name in lights, but you'll also get access to an exclusive bi-monthly podcast from the We Made This Talent Pool on podcasting, pop culture, and, well, you tell us. We'll take your suggestions. For less than the price of a coffee per month, you can help keep We Made This going. Just head to patreon.com forward slash we made this, that's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash we made this and get the ball rolling.